These notes refer to the end of section 1 of chapter 11 in your textbook. Before we talk about Dalton's law of partial pressures, we have to understand something about vapor pressure. If you remember our discussion about liquids, gases, and solids, we said that as part of the kinetic molecular theory, particles are always in motion in all three of those states. So if you have a glass of water, for example, it's got a bunch of water molecules in it, those molecules are constantly moving around, and we said that the average kinetic energy of those molecules, in other words, if you take their mass into account and how fast they're moving, the average kinetic energy of those molecules can be measured by temperature. Now, that's not to say that every single molecule in a substance has exactly the same kinetic energy. Temperature is a me measure of the average kinetic energy. On average, these particles don't have enough energy to be a gas, and that's why they're a liquid. Intermolecular forces keep them together as a liquid. But that's not to say that an occasional particle doesn't have enough energy to escape from the liquid phase and become a gas. This is what we call evaporation. As a molecule evaporates, basically it's removing a little tiny bit of energy from the water, and if the water is in, let's say, a room temperature room, over time, heat from the surroundings go into the glass and keep it on average, or the water, keep it on average the same temperature as the room. So you've always got a very few particles that have enough energy to actually become a gas. This isn't boiling, this is just evaporation. For boiling, the average temperature of the entire sample is at 100 degrees Celsius. So vapor pressure basically is a measure of how hard those molecules are pushing, on average, trying to become a gas. Okay? If you look at room temperatures, which might be anywhere from maybe down here, low 20s, 22, 23 degrees or so, you see that the vapor pressure in kilopascals is very low. It's 3, and if you remember, it's 101 kilopascals is atmospheric pressure. So compared to atmospheric pressure, these vapor pressures are relatively low, and that's why water at room temperature or room conditions tends to be a liquid. Now look what happens as we heat the water up. It gets warmer and warmer and warmer until finally it gets to this magic number, 100 degrees Celsius. Do you remember what happens to water at 100 degrees Celsius? Of course, it boils. Now look at the vapor pressure in kilopascals of water at 100 degrees Celsius. It's 101.32 kilopascals. That number should be somewhat familiar. We're not going to use it, but for reference purposes, the millimeters of mercury are also included in this chart. And if you look at the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees Celsius, in terms of millimeters, it's 760. Again, a number that should be somewhat familiar. These two numbers are the values for atmospheric pressure. Well, it kind of makes sense that in order for water molecules on average to have enough energy to become a gas fighting against the atmosphere, remember that the atmosphere is basically constantly pushing down on the surface of this water. Think of it as trying to keep the molecules in a water state. You have to put enough energy into the liquid so that it can fight against that pressure from the atmosphere. Well, if the pressure of the atmosphere is 101.3 kilopascals, then the vapor pressure of water has to match that in order for the molecules to become a gas, and that's what we call the boiling point. Our treatment of Dalton's law is going to be a little on the simplistic side, and for our purposes, all we have to know is that the total pressure of a mixture, so this applies to mixtures of gases, is equal to the sum of the individual pressures. That means each gas that's present in a mixture, remember we're talking about a mixture, contributes to the overall pressure based simply on how much of that gas there is. So here is kind of the way the mathematicians would say it. Look, the total pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressure from gas number one, regardless of what it is, plus gas number two, three, and however many total pressure, uh, total gases you have. So here's an example. We've got three different gases, A, B, and C. And you see that 
A contributes one, pre one atmosphere of pressure, B contributes two, C contributes three. If you crammed all three of these into a same size container, the total pressure would be six atmospheres. And again, you see how that previous equation, P total, equals the P, or the sum of PA plus the pressure of B plus the pressure of C. That's all there is to it. Where this is useful is a situation where we are collecting a gas that's being generated by some kind of chemical reaction. And you've done a couple experiments this year where you created gas, but you had no way of collecting it, so it just kind of went off into the atmosphere. If you remember the ba decom decomposition of baking soda lab, uh, we heated up baking soda and we lost some of the mass, and it turns out that there was water and, and carbon dioxide being given off in the reaction, but we didn't see it, we couldn't tell that it was being given off other than the fact that the mass that we had at the end of the experiment was less than the mass with which we started. So we're going to talk about a method of collecting gas from a reaction that's happening. So you notice here, this equation, we're going to make it a little simpler. I'm just going to say the pressure of the atmosphere, which is basically what you get from a weather report, the barometric pressure. Pressure of the atmosphere is just the partial pressure of the gas that we're collecting plus the partial pressure of water at those conditions, specifically the temperature. So you see how we can always figure out what the partial pressure of water is by going back up to the vapor pressure chart we had on the first page. So here's a setup that we might use to capture some gas that's being evolved in a reaction. So when we had, for example, baking soda and vinegar, when you add those, you see it bubbling, it's creating carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide basically leaves the beaker or whatever vessel we're using. Here, we've got an Erlenmeyer flask that has a cork in it, and that cork prevents gas from leaving the flask. What it does is it channels it into this tube, typically a glass tube, and then inside this beaker with water, we have a test tube. The test tube was previously filled all the way up with water, and then it was turned upside down into that beaker of water. So there was no gas in here originally. We connect all this up, and when the reaction starts generating a gas, that gas goes up the tube. Of course, there's no way for it to escape, so it gets continuously pushed through this tube, and then it bubbles up into the test tube through the water that's in there. And of course, as the gas starts filling here, it starts pushing the level of the water down into the beaker, and then you've got a test tube full of collected gas, and then you can analyze it or whatever you're gonna do with it. The problem is that as this gas bubbles through the water, it actually picks up some water molecules. Because of the vapor pressure of water, there are some molecules that have enough energy to become a gas, and the net result is that this gas collected in the test tube is not pure whatever is being generated here. There's a little bit of water in there that has to be accounted for. And the way we account for it is with Dalton's Law. And if you remember, we had it set up that the total pressure of the system, which is equal to atmospheric pressure, that's the pressure out here, is the sum of the partial pressure of the gas that we're collecting and the partial pressure of water. Now, two things that we need to know. We need to know what the atmospheric pressure is on a given day, and we need to know what the partial pressure of water is. And to do this, we need to look at the chart, and to know where to look in the chart, we need to know the temperature. So again, we need to know these two things, the current atmospheric pressure as well as the temperature. So as an example, let's say we have a reaction where oxygen is being generated from some combination of other um, substances. We're collecting the oxygen via this method of water displacement. We look up the barometric pressure from our local weather station, let's say, as well as the temperature, and we see that the pressure is slightly higher than normal. If you remember, normal atmospheric pressure is 101.325 kilopascals. So this is slightly higher than that, but that's fine. We also need to know the temperature so that we can look up the appropriate vapor pressure of water in the chart. I'm gonna start by writing down the general equation. 
So again, we see that the total atmospheric pressure is the sum of the partial pressures of oxygen in the sample and the partial pressure of water. We know what the atmospheric pressure is, so we know this guy. We're looking for this guy. What is the partial pressure of the oxygen collected? So then we have to figure out what the partial pressure of water is. If you go back and look at the chart, look at 20 degrees and find the partial pressure of water. So the first thing I'm going to do is rearrange this so we can solve for the partial pressure of oxygen. And we see that the partial pressure of oxygen will simply be the total atmospheric pressure minus the vapor pressure of water. So here's my given atmospheric pressure, 105.6. And then if I look on the chart at 20.0 degrees, I see that the vapor pressure of water is 2.34. Remember to use the kilopascals column, not the millimeters of mercury column. Stick that in the calculator and get 103.3 kilopascals, accounting for proper sig fig treatment. So here's one you can try. Helium gas is collected over water, and now the temperature in the room is warmer than it was before. In the other problem, it's 25 degrees, so you're going to go to your chart for vapor pressure along the way here someplace, and look up the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees. Remember to take the kilopascal reading. What is the partial pressure of the helium? Sorry, that should be helium. Given that the barometric pressure, remember barometric pressure is just the atmospheric pressure surrounding us, is 104.9. I'm going to stop here, give you a chance to work this out, and then start it back up to see my work. You see how I like to label my information in the problem as I go, just so I can keep things straight. So we had a slightly lower pressure than in the previous problem, but we had a higher temperature, which gave us a higher partial pressure of water that had to be subtracted out. So what this tells us is that the partial pressure of the thing in which we're really interested, namely the helium, is 101.7 kilopascals.